Hello, I am a medical doctor from Brazil and I've just been through um, COVID pneumonia. And I thought a little bit whether I should or not record this video. I realized that in medicine, before anything else, we should do no harm. But I thought it was important um, to send this message because I used a drug that's not being um, frontline into COVID, which is the Ivermectin. And I myself knew very little about that. In fact, I was introduced to it by two specialists, Dr. Tassiana Padilla, who worked for many years with Fiocruz here in Brazil and has used it largely, and uh, Dr. Denia Fitpaudi from the Federal University here in Pernambuco. The two of them have been using Ivermectin for quite a while and they had um, very um, good experiences using it against chikungunya that we had in 2015, 2016. So recently they have been um, using it for COVID and, and hoping to conduct a big study that's just waiting for approval from ethics committee. But uh, they have been using it um, in COVID. So as I'm now free from my pneumonia, I thought it was interesting to study the drug and perhaps to spring a few uh, interesting data about that. I found these articles that I want to share with you. Uh, the two first ones are from before COVID and they are basically a review about the Ivermectin and then recently there is this one that's still online talking about the doses of Ivermectin and, um, and uh, the COVID disease. Now the first article comes um, from Japan, from Tokyo uh, and Dr. Andy Crump comes out with this title of an enigmatic, multifaceted wonder drug that continues to surprise and exceed expectations. As I said, this was published in 2017. And the interesting thing is to, to know about uh, uh, ivermectin is that uh, originally um, it was discovered in Japan in a Gulf um, court by this microbiologist, Dr. Satoshi Omura, um, who, collecting soil samples, um, identified this bacteria, Streptomyces avermectinians, then it was changed the name for avermitilis, um, and uh, he realized that uh, this bacteria uh, produced uh, this complex mixture of uh, macrocyclic lactones, which were showed extraordinarily potent antihelmintic properties. Now, Dr. Um, Omura uh, he handed this to Mark Sharp, who then in, in the lab uh, semi-synthesized a mixture of two of the isoforms, the B1A and B12, um, and came out with a product that was safer and more potent than the original uh, um, uh, product, products from the bacteria, and it was called the Ivermectin, which is in the market until today. Now. Ivermectin started uh, in veterinary medicine and still in many countries I think it's used for, for animals. We have um, scientific data from it from, from the 70s and for human use it was registered in 87, still over 30 years for human use. Uh, it's considered um, the anti-parasitic drug that's more used in the whole world, millions of people, for over 30 years. And, uh, and it seems that in Africa in particular, there are large campaigns that are done from the World Health Organization, uh, where over 100 million people are treated yearly. Um, but it's considered a drug of the poor because it's basically for neglected diseases, for um, uh, verminosis, for parasito parasitologic um, uh, indications, onchocerciasis, um, I think that's the pronunciation, filaria, pediculosis. Here in Brazil, it's quite used also. Uh, for these particular um, uh, indications for um, antiparasitic drug. But the, what the author calls attention is that the mechanism of action of uh, ivermectin, despite of 40 years of use of what he calls an unmatched global success and widespread intensific scientific study, both in the private and in the public sectors, um, they say that the mechanism, uh, how it works, is still not completely clear up to now. And uh, it shows some intriguing observations. For instance, in animals, um, after you use it for a number of times, then uh, ivermectin-resistant parasites, parasites um, appear. Whereas in humans, despite of over 30 years of use and in many times as a, as a monotherapy, it seems that no confirmed drug resistance in parasites in humans exists. Um, 
there are certain things which are known about its mechanism of action, and I remember some of these things. I think you all may as well from our parasitology lessons. Um, it uh, disrupts some channels, the chloride, chloride channels, the glutamate dated, and because of that it basically paralyzed the nematodes and, uh, and they die. I remember vaguely that uh, uh, that area. It also um, acts on GABA receptors as well, but in human GABA receptors are all in the brain and the drug does not cross uh, the blood-brain barrier, so it's very safe for that uh, purpose. But what um, um, the researchers say is that there is a huge disparity between the maximum plasma concentration and the concentration required to kill um, uh, the filaria, for instance. Uh, after you take a, a, an oral drug dose of ivermectin, usually it has a peak plasma concentration around four hours, um, and then apparently a second plasma uh, uh, peak concentration between six and twelve, which they believe is due to some recycling, anthropatic recycling of the drug. But generally, it has a half-life at around twelve hours, and it's interesting that the filaria they reduced in seventy-eight percent the population of filaria within two days, and ninety-eight percent within two weeks. And then for the rest of the year, it, it, uh, it remains killing filaria. I mean, even in animal studies that have been injected with filaria, they continue to die after that. So it seems that what ivermectin does somehow is that it suppresses the parasite's ability to evade the host's natural immune defense. So uh, this is one key point about uh, ivermectin that uh, points to some immunoregulatory process in, um, in its way of action. Um, and that may explain why resistance hasn't come out, because immunomodulatory agents usually have fewer side effects, they have less opportunity for create resistances, and it might explain why over 30 years on a monotherapy it continues to work uh, in humans as an antiparasitic drug. The other interesting thing, um, which I actually didn't know, is that it's not just used um, uh, as an antiparasitic uh, drug. And as you see here with this list, there are a number of situations in which it has been used, including cancer, including uh, antiviral situations. So I think it's very important in it, uh, the editorial from Dr. Crump. Uh, it finishes by saying that there's a further indication of the increasing attention about uh, this drug. In 2013, the Chinese scientists have applied for an international patent, and that's for the use of ivermectin for new uses, um, apart, apart from what has been described. And a lot of it has, done, has to do with metabolic-related diseases, as you can see there, and uh, also with some receptor-mediated diseases. So it goes on into ather atherosclerosis, into inflammation, and into cancer. But that, I thought, was a very interesting uh, review from Dr. Crump. The second one, I'm oh, sorry, before again moving on to the second one, it, he concludes that this unique multifaceted wonder drug uh, of the past and present may yet become an even more exceptional drug in the future. It's an interesting conclusion, and as I say, this is well prior to COVID. Um, the second one is also prior to COVID. It comes from the United Kingdom, comes from Glasgow in Scotland, has this rather thought-provoking title, If a Mac to Know Drug New Tricks, and, um, and the authors in this one, they start on, start again talking about the fortuitous discovery, if fortuitous exists in life. Um, and, uh, and they remind us that um, Dr. Umura won a Nobel Prize. It was in 1975 he won a Nobel Prize for the discovery of uh, ivermectin in, in its um, uh, application in humans. Um, despite the extensive research, the authors point out again that the mode of action is still unclear, same thing as the previous one, and, uh, and also say that intriguingly, um, a, the, the range of effects is much more diverse in, in many other organisms than what it was developed to, which would be the endo and ectoparasites. So it has all these other actions, and then they point out uh, that in diabetic mice, it seems to regulate the levels of glucose and uh, cholesterol, um, that it suppresses a malignant cell pro proliferation in various types of cancer, uh, that it inhibits viral replication, and I think that's important to our particular interest here, in several flab virus here in, 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 uh, in Brazil and Recife. Doctors Padilla and, um, uh, and Fittipaldi have used it against chikungunya, and they believe that it has the same effect, uh, inhibiting the viral replication there. Uh, it reduces the survival of many vectors um, from, for instance, malaria and trypanosomiasis. 
And so a key point in, in, uh, in that second paper, similar to the first one, is that they focus on the mode of action and they really highlight the fact that the in vitro effects of ivermectin, uh, ivermectin require much higher doses, much higher concentrations, sorry, than the in vivo. And I think that's a very important point about this. And, uh, and then they say it supports the role for uh, host immune function in the mechanism of action of the drug. So I think that's important. And the third paper that's um, online now comes from, from the US, and the authors here basically uh, are looking at the approved dose from the FDA of ivermectin and, and saying that it's not ideal against COVID. Um, they refer to the um, Australian paper that showed that it can be uh, inhibited in, um, in vitro, but then bas basically they look at the concentrations required for this inhibition and conduct some simulations and, and um, got to the conclusion that definitely what is approved for use in humans would not reach um, uh, the concentrations necessary to kill the, um, the virus is not even if a dose was 10 times higher. They do point out that they, um, there is a, a difference between the lung and plasma ratio. And it's interesting, this is known for a long time. In eight, 1988, there is also uh, papers that show this, that studies um, on animals show that the drug, drugs uh, is not rapidly metabolized and uh, they, that ivermectin is the major component of various tissues, liver, kidney, and fat, and uh, we'd have lives that uh, uh, will vary quite a lot. As you see, two days in liver and kidneys, eight days in fat, uh, the vast majority of it being uh, excreted through feces. But it's very interesting, this, this big difference, and uh, it comes on to uh, the importance that probably the lungs will have much more. The lungs are the way in to the, to the new virus, as we understand it now. Um, but anyway, they conclude that, uh, in summary, the likelihood of a successful trial uh, for ivermectin alone would be, um, would be low. Um, I do refer to the previous paper that says that what happens in vitro does seem to be quite different from what uh, happens in vivo. And uh, there are some uh, data, which I won't go too much into now, but showing that populations that have been using uh, ivermectin may have um, uh, been presenting less cases of the COVID which I think would be important as well. So the key message is, as I said, I'm no specialist, I'm not defending anything, but um, I know that the world is now reaching up to um, 5 million people with this disease, number of cases increasing. I know there is a lot of question about which drugs to use or when to use drugs, all this big um, celioma around the um, hydroxychloroquine and all this. Uh, and I think that it's worth um, looking into um, some new drugs. I think we physicians have to have in mind the importance of uh, reassuring our patients uh, about the importance of keeping health, mind and body and uh, uh, facing this with a positive attitude and all this. But uh, I would, as, as a medical doctor, have a very low profile to consider treating um, the parasites of my patients, particularly with uh, ivermectin, um, at a very, very low profile if we will be helping them. Um, to be protected against COVID, I don't know. I'm not defending anything. Science needs to be uh, ahead of anything. Doctors, scientists need to control. We need to have protocols and follow. But I think we urge to look into these, um, this data. And, uh, and meanwhile, treating our patients' parasites won't do any harm. Thank you. <laughs>